Ici, avec votre beau sourire, euh, je vous souhaite la meilleure des présentations possibles. Soyez à l'aise, soyez détendu, puis donnez le meilleur de vous-même. Mon nom est Yves Grolot, professeur à l'Université du Québec à Trois-Rivières. Confiance. Bonjour, je me présente Simon Charlebois, directeur général de la SRDC Centre de Mauricie, c'est un organisme qui gère trois fonds d'investissement. Bonjour, moi c'est Valérie Gauthier et euh, je travaille pour le CEPOE, c'est un organisme fédéral qui fait du financement pour la commercialisation. Bonjour, Paul Grégoire, directeur de portefeuille chez Investissement Québec depuis cinq ans. Je suis impliqué dans le financement des entreprises depuis 25 ans. Merci. Good afternoon, everyone. So, as an angel investor, you're now faced with an interesting investment opportunity in Almer, the frozen food company. And they're now looking for additional financing to expand, and they would require financing on your part. So, our team, composed of Franco, Nicholas, and myself, Samuel, are here to take you through this opportunity and see if it's a good one that you should take. So really the issue at hand is, should you invest in Almer? And what we really want to emphasize is, as you pointed out, the risks involved in this venture. We also want to have a look at the valuation of the company to see how much should you pay. And we want to see if it's the right strategic fit as an angel investor, as you pointed out that you want to not take an active part in management, and you also want to make sure that it fits with your risk criteria. So if we begin, uh, we'd like to recommend that you do go ahead and invest in this company with $350,000, which would give you an equity stake of 41%. And if we start with the strategic rationale behind this, we would like to first move ahead and have a look at the industry, how things are going, and look at the exogenous risks that are involved. So first, it's a highly competitive industry. There's a lot of, of competition between the small firms, and what that means is that it's very hard to expand in this industry because of all this hyper-competition. So a lot of firms are small, it's very fragmented. Um, the second thing that we'd like to point out is that it is a very dynamic industry. What that means is that things are always moving in this industry and innovation is key. To stay relevant, to stay competitive, the companies in this industry have to continuously innovate to stay on top. And third is that there are constraints imposed by the natural resources, meaning uh, the company Alamer does a lot of frozen foods with seafood. And because of regulations, there is a problem scaling up operations in seafood. You are not able to to mass fish, mass farm, to get those products that you need. What that means is that you're constrained by expanding in size, so a lot of companies will expand by going to different products or different uh, segments of the industry. And that's really what the industry looks like as a whole. So what we should take out from this is that what's most important is the key success factor is in this industry is innovation, and companies should strive to innovate. Now if we have, have a look at what Alamer is doing and how it's staying relevant and competitive, we can see that they are leaders in innovation in their field. 50% of their sales comes from new products, whereas other firms only have 40%. And what's also interesting is to have a look that in the past few years, 40% of Alamer's uh, sales came from, from new products, while competitors only had 17%. So we can see that they were innovators before everyone else, and people have tried to catch up to them, but they're still innovating faster than their competitors, meaning they're true innovators in their field. They've also consistently outgrown the competitors in the market. In the last three years, they've grown at 15% more than collectively their, com their competitors in the sector have done, meaning they're able to leverage that innovation and convert it into growth. They also have a driven and dedicated CEO. She's worked tirelessly to form the company as an entrepreneur. She's very knowledgeable in the business and in the industry, and she has an ability to leverage her network, which is how a lot of the suppliers and the customers were obtained, meaning that she was able to use those skills to grow the business from the ground up. And what we'd like to really take from this is that Almer has the ability 
and has capitalized on that ability to establish themselves as leaders in the industry. And they are, as a whole, a good firm from a competitive viewpoint. But if we move forward and I have a look at how that has translated through growth, we've seen that they've posed a lot of over-reliance on their CEO, meaning that she's taken on a lot of duties, she's done a lot of the firm, and that's led to two very big risks for the firm. Uh, first, was been, it has developed a lot of uh, human resource problems and also a lot of production and a lack of marketing. So it's really issues that you have to look at in the firm if you're about to invest in it. And we'd like to really take you through those issues. So if we first have a look at the human resource issues that the firm is plagued with, the first would be an extremely high employee turnover. <coughs> and it's very difficult for this firm to retain talent, especially in its geographic area, meaning that they already have problem finding people they now also have problem retaining people, meaning that it could be a huge operational uh, danger for the firm to be able to continue running the way it is if it can't keep people or have people sufficiently trained for the tasks. It also has a lack of divisional heads, meaning the CEO, as we've mentioned, has taken on a lot of the responsibilities, meaning there's no one to take care of the uh, finance or accounting duties, which all of the competitor firms have a designated person to take care of those issues. And they also don't have any head of research and development, meaning that for a firm that's so focused on innovation, they, have, they're, they're, they might slip up if they can't focus their innovation and really structure it forward to capitalize on that. They also have poor communication with their employees and a lack of training, meaning a lot of employees are disgruntled because management is very focused on what they do. So the CEO does not really communicate her vision with the rest of the employees even though she tries to sometimes talk to them, talks to them about the new products or their, their opinion, when it comes to the company as a whole, she keeps the strategy only to herself and lets everyone else in the dark. That caused a lot of, of anger within the employees and it has caused some of them to leave. And also, of course, training, as a lot of employees don't have the technical capabilities to, to push on in the firm, and especially if you want to bring in new machinery, which is what they want money for investment, you're gonna to need to make sure that the employees are trained and they're capable to use that. So it's a big human resource risk that the company poses right now. And it all comes down to retaining efficient and experienced employees. So if we move on and have a look at the second risk, it really comes down to production marketing, which is vital to the company. First is a lack of controls. As we've mentioned, they have no, no one who takes care of the financing or accounting. What that has led to is they don't do any cost analysis for any of the products, so they price it compared to the, to the competitors, which means they, not, they might not actually be realizing the profit they should be on the items because they're mispriced. They don't do budgets, they don't do their cash budgets, so they're kind of going with the intuition of the CEO, which has worked in the past, but as we scale up with growth, they're gonna to need to structure a lot better. They also don't conduct, conduct feasibility studies, meaning they jump into new projects by thinking it's a good idea and not really having a look if it actually is a good idea. They also have high customer concentration, which is another big negative, because 70% of their sales comes from three large customers. What this means is that if one of those customers decides to jump ship and move on to another supplier, they're gonna lose a significant amount of sales, which is another danger. And they've also experienced a lack of marketing efforts, meaning all they do is word of mouth. So they're not able to branch out of their network, which is how they built from the ground up. And yes, we admit it was effective to build a company, but as they're growing, they're gonna to need to find outside suppliers, outside customers to really dilute that 70% of sales in the three customers and be able to build a stronger company overall. So what that aggregates to is production marketing poses a significant operational threat for the company and it should be addressed moving forward to make sure that you're comfortable with this investment. So if we move forward, just the things that we've looked at for this company, we've seen that they are leaders in innovation and they are also uh, have management that is driven and is really focused on the company. But we've seen that they do suffer from HR problems and they do suffer from uh, operational and uh, production problems. So what this means is that it is a good company. It's a solid company overall and it's the things that sh as an in angel investor you are looking for. Innovation and dedicated management. So it does have those things but as, we, as we've outlined they do have some risks that stem from a lack of structure to support the growth that they have taken and want to continue to take. So from a strategic standpoint this company makes sense and we want you to move forward with this investment and we'll, Frank will now take you through why the financials also support this decision. So now that Sam has painted a really nice picture about what kind of company this is and what its main strengths and weaknesses are and how, and later we will talk about how we're gonna address these weaknesses to make this company the best company possible. But from the financial standpoint, as you are an angel investor and the most important thing for you is to get the return on your investment. 
So what we looked at the, at the beginning is we made some income saving projections based on uh, relatively conservative assumption based on uh, co comparable um, comparable growth rates and your historical growth rates. And then we looked at a DCF to get a value for the equity of this company. Because you do plan to invest a certain amount of money to help finance the growth, you're going to have to uh, figure out what percentage ownership you'll have of this company after the money goes in. And then, we can give a step back, please. And then we're just going to take a look at uh, the depreciation and amortization and seeing how this affects the different uh, the, the, the different valuations, and then we're going to look at a sensitivity and then return analysis as well. So you, you can see that at the end of the day, there will be a significant return on this investment in terms of IRR. So first for our assumptions. The main things we wanted to look at were the sales, uh, which is clear as the top line is one of the most important things on any income statement. So we chose, so what, what we're really doing here is we're kind of refocusing. We've seen a big decrease in, uh, we've seen a decrease in sales growth over the last couple of years from 25% to 12% down to 7%. Uh, we really think this is uh, this is one of those derivative factors that it's a family-run business, and there hasn't been potentially as uh, it hasn't been as well run uh, going outside and hunting for new business as it could have been. So moving forward, once you step in and you're able to leverage the different relationships you have in this industry to help the company grow, we're projecting uh, we're projecting relatively uh, similar growth in the last couple of years uh, before the seven before the decline of uh, down to seven percent, and then we're also looking at adding some incremental admin costs. So this is going to be somebody to help. Uh, help the CEO take a little bit of load off of her shoulders. Someone who's going to be able to do the financing and account, the financial and accounting duties for the company, and really help focus on driving the business forward and producing the best products possible. So that's the incremental administrative cost, and then you'll see the admin cost as a whole grow at an inflationary rate of five percent going forward. And this is where the majority of the operational leverage will come from. So this is the income statement that's going to result as a, uh, this is the income statement that's going to come out as a result of our projections. So we can see that the top line is growing at a CAGR of 9%. This is still lower than what it has been historically. We actually believe that this, this can be understating the potential growth of the company. However, we don't want to bump it back up to 25% that it was growing at previously because the industry is only growing at 2%. It's not a far stretch to say that it could get back to the 20% range because it's growing off such a small base of $3 million of revenue, where the industry is about $2 billion. But we want to stay conservative on that side. And then we looked at the cost of goods sold and the gross profit. Historically, you're at about 25% in 2009. Unfortunately, it's not shown here for uh, space constraints, but it was 25% in 2009. We have you getting halfway there, halfway back there. So it's not peak margins in the last year of operations. Um, and this is, end this is gonna end up being uh, a result of, of moving uh, a better management on, uh, on your production, better, better cost management, and actually budgeting for the, for, the, uh, for the cost that you're gonna need to incur going forward, having a set budget for the company, as opposed to just having the, uh, the production done ad hoc and on the fly. And then, as we mentioned, there was the selling and admins fees. The selling fees will save uh, flat as a percentage of, uh, of revenues at about four uh, percent, and uh, the admin fees move up uh, as, as highlighted before. This all leads to significant increase in the bottom line uh, provided by the operating leverage that we just highlighted. So, on the working capital, we know that there's been some mismanagement as well on the working capital side. So, when we look at the comparable companies, we had the mature companies or the companies with the same maturity, sorry, which is less than 10 years, or the companies that are in the food processing industry. Looking at different things, it can't be a blanket statement saying that we can only focus on the, mature, the same maturity companies or the same sector companies. Because sometimes companies will have to invest early on to be able to grow. They'll have to invest in their inventory, they'll have to invest in different things, and the ratios will not always be similar across different segments. So on the accounts receivable, we know that the majority of the, custom, of the revenues come from three customers. This is a big worry for us, and this is why we didn't want to be too aggressive on the cash receivable side. So we kept the day sales outstanding at 50 days. But on the inventory, this is one place we saw, I, I guess, a pretty big mismanagement. So we saw 35 days uh, uh, days of inventory held for uh, for companies that are in the same sector, which is the food sector. And this makes sense and it's intuitive because it's food and it is a perishable. But if you look at manufacturing companies, it was about 50 days. So we do scale it down from 58 days last year to 53 days in five years. This is just for the sake of conservatism. We didn't want to go all the way down to 35 in this short period of time because it might take a little bit more time to get all the efficiencies going forward. And then on the accounts payable, well, we tend to, uh, to extend them a little bit more, but they're still going to be below the average of the of the uh, sorry of the same sector uh, uh, same sector suppliers. And this will give the change of working capital, which feeds back to the discounted cash flow. So the depreciation is the next thing. We assume that there's going to be uh, this year $200,000 of, of uh, capex which is related to the expansion. Uh, we know $100,000 of that is working capital out of the 300,000 total, so that's $200,000 of property, planning, equipment. And then we added another $50,000 for maintenance uh, capital expenditures. 
So this is just to give you an idea of what the uh, what the depreciation is going to run back into the uh, into the discounted cash flow. So for our discounted cash flow, the thing I've been talking about for the last five minutes, this is one of the most important things in valuing a company, and we wanted to look at the cost of equity for this company because the angel investor is taking a stake, a significant stake, in the equity of the business. We didn't want to look at the debt side of it other than to make sure that they're able to pay down the debt and deleverage over time. But we wanted to make sure that he's able to realize a solid return on his investment. So we assumed that the risk-free rate would be at about 3% to calculate our cost of equity. And then we looked at a beta. We thought this company was relatively cyclical, so we assumed a beta of about one. And then we had to add discounts and discount because the company is very small, the company is private, and the company does and has had some execution risk. So if this can't get short up, the cost of equity and the return that's required has to go up going forward. So here is our DCF. This is what this is what the whole valuation is based upon. The, really, the main thing that we wanted to highlight is that the company right now, on an equity basis, is worth about eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, slightly below, and this implies about a six point four times price to ever, price to earnings ratio. This is not this is not out of whack when you consider that private uh, public companies in the markets that are a ton more scale have grown a lot better, more solid mar margins, and greatly managed, with obviously very high liquidity because they're public. Uh, these kind of staple companies are trading between 14 and 16 times. So when we're looking at a company that's about $3 million in sales, $200,000 in net income, we're not too worried about the uh, PE of six and, six and a half times right now. We actually think this is a very fair valuation on the company's equity. On the debt schedule, this is really what we just wanted to do to, to get a look, of, uh, look at uh, how they get paid down. We saw that uh, there's significant free cash flow to pay it down. Uh, on the returns, this is the most important thing. So 35% is the IR, that's the yearly return. We assume that 60% of the free cash flow is paid out in dividends to the, uh, to the owners. Uh, so that's uh, gonna be both Madame Bulgo and yourself. Uh, so you're getting 40%, at 41%, which is your pro forma owner ownership of the company in the dividends that are paid out. So moving forward, we just want to sensitize what the company would be worth uh, if we're looking at uh, different uh, uh, variables. We believe that uh, the 22% to cost of equity and 4.5% terminal growth are fair, so we believe that 934 is a good number, but there is some, uh, some movement. So now we're gonna look at the implementation and how we're gonna apply different things to this company to make it better and really realize these efficiencies. So in the implementation, what we're gonna uh, work through here is that we wanna work through the control of company and we wanna work through the restructuring company and then the long term. So here we see that we need a $300,000 investment for the business through equipment, construction, and working capital. Yet we propose 350 as we've known that she has not done feasible studies on other projects and we want to be conservative and add a little bit extra. Moving forward, the production operation. Um, what is the control of the company afterwards? So we see that this would be an acquisition of 41% of the control. Now what we're proposing here is that we, rem we leave her as CEO as she is dedicated, but she needs support. So we want uh, to A, recommend a board of directors and B, as we'll see later on, some management. So on the board of directors, the angel investor will have a seat. He will have two of his contacts. As we mentioned, he has a lot of contacts in the industry. And then she would appoint two of the members, maybe her father and her brother who are also working in the business. What's important is that she remains controlled through the shareholders and CEO, but yet as, as an investor, the angel investor has control somewhat with the board of directors, which is very important to have a cohesiveness. Moving forward, we can see the personnel. Now, she needs to be surrounded with a strong management, and we, we see that she has a lack of head of, of R&D, as well as head of finance and control. So we want to propose the head of R&D is established to control the patent, so she is protected through the innovation that we've outlined as important later, uh, earlier on. She wants to continue the uh, uh, innovation, as it is extremely important to her growth, and of course, the head of finance. She needs to have a grip on her inventories, on the costs, and of course, later on on the receivables and the payables. Uh, and of course, continuing training. As we mentioned before, she needs to communicate and grow the business with her. She cannot act alone and she needs to accumulate. So we're, we're proposing an open door policy as well so that she, she can uh, have the problems come up from the bottom and deal with them further on. With the production operation, uh, we want you to increase your supplies, your supplier's flexibility. As we've mentioned before, there are some uh, only um, extreme dependence on suppliers. Now, as you move forward, we want you to diversify the, the, uh, the suppliers, but also have them more flexible. And as you move forward with the diversified uh, suppliers, you're less reliable on each individual one. And therefore, you have more freedom as you grow. Of course, with the plan strategy, we want you to do market analysis, price testing, and feasibility tests. As you're producing a new product, since this is innovation, we're putting a lot of products, we want you to recommend that there's 
price uh, testing, feasibility studies, so there's better impact and there's a follow through so that we're not implementing strategies that will not work in the, uh, further. And of course, your customers. Who is buying your products? We want you to di diversify as well so that you cannot um, be adversely affected through one loss of customer. We want you to be very uh, flexible. And in the long term, what we're looking is a successive plan. We want her to work uh, and as uh, give her the opportunity that if she wants to transfer to be the board of directors. So we want to keep her in insight and her input and therefore as she's transiting on the long term, we want to put her on the board. Internal, uh, in internalize the data process. We, do, we are uh, out, um, outsourcing this. We want to bring it inside, do some cost uh, savings, but this of course is a long term process. In the communication and training, I want to continue uh, to establish a long term uh, evaluation to continue the training and the communication. But of course, the exit strategy. Once the uh, uh, angel investor wants to get out, who should he sell it to? Now, there's obviously the brothers and the fathers have mentioned that they want to keep a short-term investor and then therefore, so the first uh, strategic fit is to sell back to the family. And then after that, you could also have a financial or strategic buyer, which is very important. So as a conclusion, what I've shown you today is that it makes sense strategically. Financially, it is very sound. And of course, there are some, a lot of work to do with the management and the restructure. But if it's all implemented, the rewards are much uh, great enough to uh, withstand all the risks. But okay, thank you very much and open the door for questions. Belle présentation pour aussi bien de la fin. Euh, juste savoir, moi j'ai une approche de management que peut-être vous connaissez, qu'on appelle le KISS, le Keep It Simple Stupid. Il y a plusieurs informations que vous avez transmises. Si vous arrivez à me sortir les trois principales qui appuient votre recommandation, les trois plus importantes selon vous, c'est lesquelles? Euh, la première, c'est de voir la compagnie et le potentiel euh, pour euh, grandir la, la, la compagnie. De un, comme un investisseur, l'angel investor, lui, quand il regarde la compagnie, c'est quoi le potentiel? Lorsqu'on voit la compagnie et la structure, on voit que sur la structure présente, euh, il y a beaucoup de problèmes, mais avec les recommandations qu'on a faites, on peut voir qu'il y a un grand potentiel et c'est là l'importance. Euh, la deuxième, c'est aussi le potentiel est tel, on peut tu réaliser le potentiel? Lorsqu'on a vu avec les numéros, on a vu que le IR était extrêmement élevé, on a vu que qu'on pouvait euh, administrer beaucoup euh, sur le, euh, payer la dette euh, et continuer. Fait que le, financièrement, ça fait du sens. Et stratégiquement, est-ce que c'est un, euh, un processus qui peut être euh, dans le long terme? Fait On a vu que oui, la stratégie était sombre, était une petite compagnie qui pouvait continuer à grandir. Et il euh, y a beaucoup d'acheteurs pour sortir de la position. Lorsqu'on veut sortir, c'est extrêmement important de savoir si on peut avoir une valuation appropriée pour euh, la sortie. Et là, Je pense, un, la structure pour, pour les coûts. On a, on a vu qu'on voulait implémenter euh, Head of Finance. Mm -hmm. Ça, c'est extrêmement important parce que les coûts, euh, lorsqu'on voit, c'est à cause qu'elle a grandi extrêmement vite, elle, elle s'est appropriée, puis il y a beaucoup de coûts qui ne sont pas sous contrôle. Lorsqu'on voit, on veut contrôler les receivables, l'inventaire, et ça, c'est vraiment pour qu'elle ait une structure pour qu'on soit à grandir. Lorsque les coûts sont sous contrôle, euh, agrandir la compagnie est extrêmement facile. Ça, c'est euh, la mesure. Vous avez parlé tout à l'heure de Head of Finance, justement. Quel, quel type de, 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 de personne vous voyez qui peut être en place et quel honoraire, quel type de rémunération vous pouvez offrir à une personne comme ça? La, la hauteur et le genre de rémunération. Bien, on, on cherchait vraiment quelqu'un pour s'occuper de, comme le collègue a expliqué, les contrats sur les coûts. Parce que c'est un gros problème, elle ne regarde pas combien ces affaires ont coûté. Donc, on devrait aller chercher quelqu'un avec vraiment un, un, de l'éducation en comptabilité, en finance, parce que de l'expérience euh, comme contrôleur, peut-être. Euh, puis la rémunération, on regarderait peut-être entre les 70 000 et 80 000 pour que ça soit. Euh, on, on a budgété 150 000 pour les champs qu'on voulait faire. Ça, c'est quand même un bon salaire pour mettre dans ce qu'on C'était pour euh, finance et euh, recherche et développement Oui. Okay. Pour faire les deux, parce qu'on voulait vraiment ramener de la structure pour pouvoir euh, poursuivre avec l'agrandissement la, de la compagnie. Comme ça, c'est vraiment ce qu'on regarderait euh, à ce moment-là. Merci d'avoir répondu en français, comme question en français. Je <rire> <rire> Juste pour euh, 
préciser, donc vous avez dit 150 000 pour les changements que vous voulez faire. Oui. Mais dans le, dans le PowerPoint, c'est marqué « Working Capital » de 100 000. Non, c'est ça. C'était dans les prévisions. C'était dans les prévisions. C'était dans les prévisions. Peut-être juste une dernière petite question. Au niveau des projections de 9 que vous prévoyez de croissance, c'est réaliste selon vous? C'est pas, même sur plusieurs années, c'est quelque chose qui peut être maintenu dans un an? Ah, pour, la, pour la croissance de, du premier? Oui. Oui, sûrement, parce qu'on passe. La principale raison que la croissance est, est en décroissance, c'est euh, parce que c'est un peu d'un un, un manque de focus. Uh, Excuse-moi, je vais changer en anglais. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, to drive the business forward and, and, and actually get new accounts. Because we know that 70% of the business is in three companies or three clients. Uh, and we think that it's kind of just been riding on the coattails of that. So as soon as you can get some sort of force, changing that a little bit, getting, I guess, a little kickstart to the company, uh, 9% growth off a base of $3 million isn't incredibly aggressive in our opinion. Uh, and we also think that if, if we're moving forward, um, Uh, the industry as a whole is growing at 2%. If we're growing at 9%, it's it's a, almost a negligible or non-existent market share gain because the base is so small. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour le temps. Merci bien. Merci. 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 Mer